This week on the Marketplace of Ideas, a conversation about David Hume with Simon Blackburn, professor of philosophy at Cambridge University and the University of North Carolina, author of How to Read Hume. Simon Blackburn is a professor of philosophy at the University of Cambridge, a research professor of philosophy at the University of North Carolina, and a vice president at the British Humanist Association. His new book, How to Read Hume, is a master class on understanding David Hume, the greatest British philosopher. Simon, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Colin. Hello. We have the distinct misfortune here of having only one hour to discuss the work of David Hume, but we'll do what we can. And first things first, David Hume is well known, of course, to philosophers, but I shudder to think there may be a listener who doesn't know who he is. So purely in terms of David Hume the man, not necessarily his work, who was Hume? Well, Hume was born in the Scottish Lowlands, uh, just south of Edinburgh, uh, in 1711. He grew up uh, moderately prosperous, um, not an aristocrat by any means, but uh, a sort of yeoman farmer, as they said. Um, he enrolled in Edinburgh University at the usual age, which was very young in those days. He um, performed well, but there's nothing remarkable about his uh, life up till the end of his teenage years. He then um, uh, rather unsuccessfully tried a career at law, but he couldn't stand it. And he tried uh, um, various things, but he, invent- in, he had some kind of crisis or nervous breakdown or depression, uh, went home, recuperated a bit. He found he could enjoy almost nothing but books and philosophy, so he determined to have a literary life. Uh, He removed himself to France, where he lived very, very quietly in the country, in a place called La Flèche, not far from Angers, in northern France famous because there was a Jesuit college there, and there may have been a library which he uh, used. Um, And there he completed his first and greatest book, the so-called The Treatise of Human Nature. He came back to London in 1739. Um, He was still only 28 um, with the completed manuscript, got it published. It wasn't a great success. It wasn't the success he'd hoped for. But it was okay. It was good enough to introduce him to the learned world, as it were. And then he started writing shorter essays, which were also collected into volumes. And gradually he adopted the life of a man of letters. There were odd breaks. um, But for the next 25 years, he wrote more philosophy, more essays, and the great history of England. He was the first great great historian uh, of um, England and a great um, a model and example to subsequent historians like Gibbon and Macaulay. And then uh, he lived until 1776, uh, at the age of 64, when he, he died in Edinburgh. He lived ne- most of the rest of his life in Edinburgh. There was a rather splendid interlude when he was appointed the, um, uh, the secretary to the uh, embassy in Paris, or Hartford's embassy. And he had a tremendous success as a sort of, by then he was a a distinguished man. He was a giant of the um, Enlightenment and much fated by the philosophes in France. So that was an agreeable interlude. Um, But he returned to Edinburgh, lived quietly with friends, and as I say, died in 1776. So that was his life. It wasn't very eventful, but it was um, eventful enough for him to know the ways of men and um, and also, of course, he had a lot of, awful lot of leisure for reading and writing, which he used very well. Speaking as a philosopher, then, what do the, what does the life and what do the works of Hume mean to you personally? Well, they mean a great deal. I think it's fair to say that he was the first naturalist in European philosophy. And by naturalist, I mean somebody who had a long, cool, empirical look at human beings for what they are. And he resolutely refused any theological interpretation of what we're like, any divine interpretation. He was irreligious, 
Um, he tended to refuse the word atheist, although he um, was uh, universally known as the great infidel. He had nothing but contempt for the established church and for priestcraft, as it was called, as he called it. And you could see in, in his writings an awful lot of Darwin, uh, you know, a century earlier. Um, there isn't, of course, um, the, the, the principle of natural selection, but there is the idea that Human beings are animals, first and foremost. We're animals who have to find our own niche in the world. We have um, our needs and our limited capacities to supply them by ourselves. So we're social animals. And it was the nature of humanity as an empirical and social animal that interested Hume and that sort of informed all his works. So I think those of us who think that that's the right kind of ideology, the right set of attitudes to bring to the study of human nature, always look to Hume as a great uh, inspiration and a great pioneer. How stark a contrast is Hume's view of humanity and how humanity should be studied from the philosophers that preceded him? Well, it would depend a little bit who you took, um, but even if you took his, say, the two giant predecessors in, uh, known as the, uh, the British empiricists, that's uh, John Locke and uh, Bishop Berkeley, well, both of those are Christians. They both thought that an important thing to say about mankind was the way he related to God, the way we relate to a divine world. It's uh, freedom from that that marks Hume out. He was also a much more resolute empiricist. He cared about the way the senses give us information. Each of Locke and Berkeley were prepared to duck out into a rather mysterious faculty called reason which filled up the gaps, and reason might tell us about, for example, that we were God's children, or that um, the world was going to be um, uh, comfortable for us and our descendants, or that there'd be uh, improvement in an afterlife. And for Hume, reason was utterly incapable of telling us any such thing. So he was anti-rationalist and anti-theist, and particularly anti the idea that uh, reason could give you any insight into the divine nature and tell you how to conduct your life or what to expect or who to fear or what to hope for. So um, I think the only serious predecessors he had were not there in the proximate Western tradition uh, or Western European tradition, but possibly there in the classical world. You can certainly see echoes of Uh, Epicurus in Hume. You can see echoes of Stoicism uh, and echoes uh, of uh, Aristotle and Cicero. So you can see classical authors who influenced him greatly. But of course, um, the Stoics had a very sort of thinned out sense of religious belief, and Hume had, in effect, none at all. So, yes, they're predecessors. There are always predecessors in philosophy. Another person that one might look at is Thomas Hobbes, who shared quite a lot of Hume's orientations um, a century and a half earlier. Um, But Hobbes had the misfortune of not writing as well as Hume. (laughs) (laughs) How much was Hume's, we'll call it, anti-theism, how much does that account for why you latched on to Hume's writings when you first discovered them for yourself? Oh, quite little, actually. I wasn't very interested in his uh, in his skepticism about religion, because I've never been a religious person. And so, you know, I've just always taken skepticism about religion for granted. But I was much more interested in some of the analyses of the theory of knowledge that he gives. gives. And then in the second half of my own career, I became interested in moral philosophy, more interested in moral philosophy, and discovered that the things Hume says about that are, are stunning and, and wonderful and original. So, you know, he's been a great influence on me in in that respect as well. In terms of the modern world of philosophers, I want to know where does Hume stand with them in general? I mean, you meet a lot of philosophers who respect Hume very much, like you yourself do. Is he universally respected this much? Well, it's difficult to make philosophers unanimous about anything. <laughs> I think... Um, it would be a very odd list of your top five philosophers that didn't uh, contain Hume, I think. I think you'd find a consensus putting him up there. Some people might put Plato and Aristotle above him. Uh, some people 
um, might put um, you know some more modern figures like Wittgenstein above him. But um, I think very few lists of the top five wouldn't include him. When writing this book, How to Read Hume, which is of course part of a wider How to Read series with a, a variety of texts, how do you how do you even go about approaching such a body of work to condense it into this book, which is less than 150 pages? My copy is 110, including the end notes. How do you how do you go about this? The series, as you rightly say, it's a book in a series. The series has a sort of template, a format, which is there to be ten chapters, um, each of them's to center on a characteristic quotation or, you know, a, a passage which gives them uh, a central emblematic line of thought from the thinker, and you, you take the passage and you uh, try and uncover what a, you know what its importance is, what its interest is, what he's saying. Uh, what he's not saying, because Hume does get misread quite often. <laughs> then you look at the word count, and as that mounts up, you have to start to be uh, very condensed and rather brisk about it. And of course, there is a danger in that. But personally, I enjoy it because I find I um, I, I I like the exercise of filtering and filleting out the real nuggets. Occasionally, having a bash at other readers on the side. <laughs> so, I seem to enjoy that. When you're doing this filtering, then, what were the pieces of knowledge about Hume that were in your mind as absolutely vital, that were not going to get cut no matter what? You had to get them across. Right. Well, I had to say something about his empiricism, because that's the, as it were, the engine room of all his philosophy. That is his conviction that all knowledge and all meaning derives from experience. So that had to go in. Uh, I had to say something about um, his views on causation. Uh, because that's possibly his most famous single contribution to philosophy. I had to say something about his views on the self, because he was also one of the first philosophers to puzzle very deeply about the elusive, fragmentary, kind of kaleidoscopic nature of our own selves. Um, The self had seemed a sort of datum, a soul, a, a thing we know about better than any other, to philosophers such as Descartes and... Um, Leibniz. But for Hume, the self was problematic, and self-knowledge was a strange and very patchy affair. And that's a very modern idea, of course. So I wanted to to get in that. Empiricism, causation, the self, um, he has some very interesting views about perception, which have only recently, I think, been appreciated. So I wanted to get in his account of our knowledge of the external world, or our lack of knowledge of the external world in some respects. That was all the kind of heavy lifting, the heavy-duty fundamental philosophy. After that, possibly slightly sexier bits include his his ethics, I wanted to say, about his um, views about reason and the passions, which are very influential, very important. And what wonderful mechanisms of the emergence of convention and such things as respect for promises and contracts and governments and property which he devoted uh, quite a large part of the, of the third part of the treatise to. So those, those were, as it were, straightforward. They had to all go in. Then um, I thought that readers would want to know about his irreligion, his lack of religion, and his arguments for his position. So they had to go in. And that really left, I think, only um, the standard of taste, which is one of his later and very great essays on aesthetics. And I thought that that was sufficiently interesting in its own right to deserve a chapter. So that's scraped in by the skin of its teeth. I'd like to try to discuss as much of this as possible. It's probably hopeless to discuss it all, but first, empiricism. The idea that knowledge derives from experience. Someone will, will hear that who has not read Hume, and they'll say, well, yes, of course it does. Why, why was that a surprising thing for Hume to write? It's not so much that knowledge derives from experience, which I agree, I agree can sound kind of platitudinous, and people are going to say, well, I could have thought of that. It's that all knowledge derives from experience, and that little word all makes a difference. A lot of philosophers had pondered the, the, the important place of experience in, in providing knowledge, but they'd nearly all seized on reason as a kind of equal partner, or even an elder brother. There was experience as formed and shaped by principles of reason, which mattered to them. 
Hume was one of the first to take a much more radical view. He basically thought reason, which was the darling of philosophers like Plato and Aristotle, most of the Greeks, all the previous centuries, great figures like Descartes, Spinoza, and Leibniz, reason, which was, as I say, the darling of those philosophers, for Hume did practically nothing. <laughs> it was basically trivial. He thought that uh, logic and arithmetic about the implications of various propositions and bits of knowledge we had, but we had to feed them with data from the senses. And the enterprise of drawing out implications was basically pretty trivial. So he completely threw aside the tradition according to which uh, scholastic reasoning, logic, metaphysics was going to somehow reveal marvelous structures of the world we lived in. in of course, theological structures, but also uh, natural laws, things that we could argue have to be so, necessities that surround us. None of that appealed to Hume at all. So it's a, the radical nature of what he's providing comes in the, uh, the view that all knowledge comes through the senses, and reason has a very, very minimal role, no role in shaping knowledge, only a role in inferring um, trivial consequences from bits of knowledge that experience has provided. If you speak to a non-philosopher, I would think that you ask them, what do you think philosophers do? And they would say, well, philosophers, they reason all day long. So w what remains What remains in philosophy without it? Well, he, that's a very good question. And Hume himself pondered it. He, um, he, the pessimism about the, um, the, the possibilities for reason, when he Sort of when he finally uh, drew all the consequences out from his own position, there's a marvelously autobiographical and rather kind of melancholy chapter at the end of the first part of the treatise when he where he's done this, and he asks where where this leaves him. You know, how can he go on writing? How can he have anything to say if um, the powers of reason are as limited as his? researchers had, had brought him to believe. He rather despairingly says, well, I'm not sure, I'm not sure where I stand. Um, what I do know is I like going on thinking about it, so I'm going to do that. <laughs> and um, and he, uh, he, as it were, rather, possibly rather lamely falls back on the harmless pleasure that it produces for him to uh, the harmless entertainment that it uh, gives him to go on writing. And that's his uh, his kind of apology for doing performing an activity which he could be argued to have uh, to have shown to be impossible. <laughs> Moving on to his ideas about causation. Now here he does say something that'll be counterintuitive. What what did Hume bring to the table causation wise? He looked um, in accordance with the resolute empiricism. He he analyzes our experience of causation. What do we actually see, or hear, or feel, or touch. And he convinces himself that all we basically see, or feel, or hear, or touch, is one damn thing after another. One event following temporarily upon another nearby one. Now, in seeing that succession of events, we don't see causation. We only see the, the post hoc. We don't see the propter hoc. We don't see the because. We only see the afterwards. So where do we get the idea of causation from? It's got to have a source in experience, um, but it doesn't seem to be disclosed to us through the senses. Um, so he casts around and he decides what happens is that the mind, the human mind, on coming across events in experience, um, finds them in patterns. We impose or select or abstract out patterns in which events fall. These are regularities. So it's one damn thing following another, but at least they do it in an orderly way. And so Hume then had the brilliant stroke of saying, well, perhaps causation is not so much disclosed to us, but is projected by us. But the mind, having um, discovered order, having really experienced order in events, then sees it as if the first event, the, the, the prior event, 
causes the second, is, as it were, responsible for it or necessitates it or makes it happen. So causation becomes a kind of uh, net which we throw over the world to render it tractable, to enable us to predict and to enable us to control happenings. It's not something that we find. It's something that we project or invent or construct. You could use all these metaphors. And then, um, and then armed with it, we uh, produce our own causal interpretations of patterns of events. Um, but it's all our own doing. Uh, and are, we're reliable in doing it only insofar as we conform to the order in which events disclose themselves. So that's the nutshell. And of course, it sounds very odd, um, you know, that we are responsible for causation. That just sounds bizarre. And put like that, it is bizarre. And that's an unnecessarily paradoxical way of seeing it. Um, I think a, a good way of thinking about it, and arguably the way that Hume, uh, Hume came to it, is via a parallel theory, which was also his theory in ethics. Um, so so shall, I, shall I go on and tell you about that? Indeed, sure. I, would, don't, I don't see why not. If you think about morality, again, he's going to have trouble... Um, seeing morality is disclosed by the senses. Uh, the senses may show us people, people being happy, people in pain, people suffering, people not suffering, people being joyful, um, people being miserable. Um, but it doesn't apparently show us, the senses don't show us uh, good and bad and right and wrong. That seems to be more or less, more, more something we bring with us. We value things and we provide obligations by insisting on boundaries to conduct and insisting that people behave in different ways and so on. So again, ethics has this, this appearance of having this genesis more in our mind's reaction to things than in things themselves. And then you might say, well, sure, so we end up talking about people having obligations, people being under duties, other people having rights. We talk about some things being better than others and other things being worse and so on. We do all this valuing, but it's at bottom, it's us doing it. It's not something that the world is giving us. It's something that we are imposing on the world or projecting on the world. And Hume talked in terms of us um, gilding or staining objects borrowed with uh, objects with the col col colors borrowed from internal sentiment. And that was, uh, that was the metaphor that he, he offered. And then you could see the theory of causation as, in effect, a parallel theory um, about causation. So it was modeled, actually, his theory of causation on um, what, he, what he thought had to be said about ethics. And that might make it slightly more palatable. He was very um, convinced that this left a lot of practice the same. You could go on using causal language just as you go on moralizing and valuing things and insisting on boundaries to conduct and so on. Um, but that if you remembered and learned that and fully grasped that the source of this activity lay within the shape of your own mind rather than the shape of things, then, um, then it took on a different cast and you'd do it in a different and better and more educated way. How much, to what extent did he think that there was a negative effect of humans, whether the issue was causation or whether the issue was valuation. How negative did he think that these habits of mind were when they allowed to go unchecked? I think he thought, I think not like Kant after him, Immanuel Kant, the, the great German philosopher who followed on from Hume and who, who admitted that he was woken from his dogmatic slumbers by reading Hume. Um, I think like Kant, Hume had a strong sense that the healthy propensities, for example, to, va to valuations and to um, causal interpretations of things, could rapidly get out of hand. And the pride of reason would start make people start seeing you know, causal rules and causal laws and causal principles everywhere. And that when they properly realize the source of our knowledge of causation, then that, that propensity would be checked. So the pride of reason would be curtailed. Reason would be confined to its proper domains, which were basically 
uh, the empirical world, sorting out patterns in the empirical world. Um, and that would stop people doing metaphysics. It would stop them thinking that, for example, they could find arguments for the existence of a god, because that would be quite outside your causal experience. You know, we have no no experience of things making universes, so we've got no experience of how they're made. We've got no experience of gods or anything else making them. Um, so any attempt to infer the existence of a deity via causal reasoning was going to be doomed from the start. And I, he thought that the proper understanding of the psychology, the source of our causal knowledge, such as it is, uh, would give us a proper modesty, what he uh, what he liked to call a mitigated skepticism. Continuing in the vein of human minds over-interpreting the sense data they receive, what did Hume had to have to say about that in the area of the self, personal identity? Well, his first observation about the self and personal identity is that um, we, don't, we, we don't have experience of a continuing self, he thought. Um, looking inside his own mind, he finds the kind of theater of sense experience is constantly changing. Your experience changes every time you turn your head or you blink. Your feelings are different from one day to the next. There's no continuous object of experience, which is the self. Um, so again, being a rigorous empiricist, he's got to account for the idea we seem to have of it. And he comes up with the image of a commonwealth. He thinks of the sense of the, kind of the self, I'm sorry, as a kind of, not a unity, not a, a thing which uh, has its own identity and might sail away after your body uh, ceases its uh, physical existence. He thinks of the self just as a, a kind of, again, a kind of aggregation or construction of a lot of this experiences. The experiences go on. The, um, there are um, similarities. You have some of the same memories today that you had yesterday. Um, there's overlapping chains of resemblance between experiences. Um, but none of that gives rise to anything which deserves properly to be called a thing or a substance uh, which continues throughout all the changes of your life. So another parallel might be to a club. If you imagine, a, say, a, you know, a gentleman's club in London or somewhere, it'll have a shifting membership, it can have a shifting constitution because the members can change the rules, it might have uh, shifting officers, different secretary, different president, it might shift its premises. We go on calling it the same club, you know, it's the Athenaeum or whatever it is, 300 years after its founding, after all these changes. But if you ask what stayed the same, then there seems to be no thing. It's just we, again, it's us imposing a kind of identity on a shifting kaleidoscope of events. And it was by transporting that idea into connection with the self uh, that Hume made his original and I think very modern uh, view of the, the nature of personal identity. That's how he expressed it. So that's, that's what happens there. And again, you can see a parallel. It's the same cast of mind at work as with causation or ethics. It's um, that the world doesn't give us something. It's not that we impose it or project it. What do his views, or how do his views, on, on perception, as you said, they've only recently come to be respected as much as they maybe should be, how do those link up with this whole chain of thought? Yes, well, with perception, he did re run into a real stinker, because with perception, um, he, he was convinced that the primary data of the mind, the experiences on which everything rests, had to be thought of as fundamentally private, and dependent upon us. For example, my visual experience clearly depends on me. It's, it depends on where I am, it depends on what I'm looking at, it depends on whether I choose to open my eyes in more, um, you know, recherche ways. It depends on me, too. If, um, if things have gone badly wrong, my vision might be blurry. Um, but the world hasn't gone blurry. It's my experience that's gone blurry. Um, or it might be distorted in color or whatever. So he convinced himself, and he thought it was obvious to anyone who reflected for a minute or two, that our experiences were 
dependent, dependent on us, as I just said. They're kind of discontinuous, and they're at no distance from ourselves. My experience, in the natural metaphor, is that my visual experience takes place in my head. Now, in all those respects, they're different from the way we take objects of the external world to be. The objects of the external world we think of as largely independent of us. You know, the motor car that I'm looking at, or even if I turn my back on it, um, we think of them as um, continuous. The motor car doesn't go out of existence when I blink, although my experience does. And finally, they're at a spatial distance from us. The motor car is... Uh, you know, 20 yards from me, whereas my visual experience is not. So this had led previous philosophers like John Locke to postulate what he called a, what Hume called a double existence. Locke's theory was basically the, the stalking horse, the target for this part of Hume's philosophy, I believe. And, okay, so your experience is one thing, the external world is another thing, but that's all right because the external world can be reliably as it were, indicated by your experience. Your experience can resemble it. Well, now, Berkeley <laughs> and other philosophers in France had said, well, that doesn't really cut the mustard. That doesn't really do, because um, this is before Hume, because how, does, how, how can the theory of knowledge take us over the gap if there's two, double existence, experience one thing, objects in the external world the other thing, how on earth do we manage to cross the gap? Think of it like this. Suppose you, suppose you spend all your life in a theater, in a literal, literally in a theater, uh, and you see various scenes on the stage or various films or whatever you see. You've got a, you've got a life going on inside the theater, and you're asked to tell about life outside the theater, but just on that basis. You're allowed no access to no direct access to the world outside the theater, it sounds as though you'd be stuck. You wouldn't know, you wouldn't have any way of knowing how the scenes that you do see are caused or brought about by the things you never see. This would be a classic case of theorizing beyond experience because experience is confining you to the theater. But if you're trying to talk about a a separate existence, a separate world, a world outside the theater, you'd be completely impotent. You wouldn't be able to get there. So skepticism seemed to lure, uh, seemed to, lure, to stare Locke in the face. And nearly all philosophers in the generation following Locke found that a real problem. Barclay found it a problem, Hume found it a problem, Kant found it a problem, uh, and they all tried to give their own solutions to it. Well, Barclay, <laughs> sorry, can I go on? I just oh, certainly. I know I've been talking far too much, um, but it's so exciting. <laughs> um, <laughs> Barclay thought, right, we can solve this by getting rid of the outside. So Barclay drives the entire world back into your own head. Um, that's subjective idealism, as it's called. Well, Hume, coming after Barclay, um, just saw flatly that this won't do. That's incredible. Nobody's going to believe that. But he thought that Berkeley was right to um, see the skeptical problem that loomed for Locke. So Hume comes at it, and the one thing he does see is that the, double, the story of double existence will not do. If the, if, the, if the Lockean story did represent our position, then it's not just that we couldn't know about the external world, it's very unclear how we could even think about it, how you could have the idea of it. And again, his resolute empiricism doesn't allow our ideas to outrun our experiences. So, so Hume lays down the axiom that with us, our experiences are the things we see. And the then the problem is how you make sense of that, because we had these little arguments a moment ago that they can't be. Um, and eventually, this lead drives Hume to despair. The chapter in which he talks about this is the most despairing chapter in the treatise. And it ends up saying, carelessness and inattention alone will afford us any remedy. Um, and that's the remedy of finding a 
satisfactory way to account for the way our perceptual experience gives us knowledge of the world. If you're just tuning in, this is the Marketplace of Ideas from Colin Marshall Radio at colinmarshallradio.com. On that website, you'll find other podcasts, our complete show archive, and more. My guest is Simon Blackburn, author of How to Read Hume, professor of philosophy at Cambridge University and the University of North Carolina. There's one move in this particular discussion that I think may be a stumbling block for listeners or even even for readers of philosophy, and that is that the issue of directly experiencing something as opposed to sense experiencing it. Now, how is one to conceive, even in their imagination, of experience that is not sense experience? Oh, I think um, as far as this part of the discussion goes, all our experience is sense experience. The experience which isn't sensory would really be consigned to self-consciousness, consciousness of, for example, the states of our body are sometimes thought uh, to be non-sensory. For example, suppose, you, uh, suppose you've got your hand in your pocket. You know you've got your hand in your pocket, um, but it's arguable that you don't know it on the basis of external sense experience. You just know it. So there are things like that, which are basically intimate uh, intimate self-knowledge, knowledge that monitors the state of our body, which uh, don't come through the senses. They make it, well, one can talk of the senses, but not, it's not sight, hearing, and touch, and the smell and taste. Um, it's something to do with uh, the way in which, um, you know, stresses and strains in various nerves and muscles present themselves to us, but we don't, we're not conscious of that. All we're conscious of is with our hands are in our pockets. That's that's the only contrast that uh, one wants there. As far as the Locke Barclay Hume problem goes, it's really things like vision and touch, which are the channels through which we know about external things and the layout of the world around us. And it's how they work that's that's the problem. We've touched on the some of the main ideas that Hume put forth, but how well were the works that contained these ideas received in Hume's lifetime? There was a gradually uh, upward, upward rising graph, um, as I said, in, 19, in 1739, when he came back from France with the manuscript of a treatise and got it published in London, his own account was it fell stillborn from the press. The image was that of a stillbirth. It wasn't quite as bad as that. People did discuss it in the, in the rather small learned world, the world of learning. Um, but it didn't sell as he'd hoped, and it didn't make a big splash. The essays were better received. They attracted notice. In 1748, he kind of reissued the treatise in a, kind of, in a slightly dilute form, the so-called inquiry concerning human understanding, which was a, a sort of, um, well, it depends which Hume scholar you listen to. I think of it as a slightly dilute version of the treatise. Uh, other scholars think it represents Hume's considered opinion and was a, in some respects an, an advance on the treatise. And one can argue about that. It's certainly a much easier read. And um, intro philosophy courses do well to give people the inquiry and not the treatise to start with. It's also a good deal less despairing. It cuts out some of the really intricate passages which led to skeptical melancholy and in confessing he just couldn't see his way through all the thickets of problems uh, and presents a rather sunnier kind of empiricism. And this was quite popular. This became, uh, if not a bestseller, at least a, a, a very significant book. Partly, of course, because it had the scandalous chapter on miracles in it, which he'd suppressed from the treatise when he was younger. And uh, this outraged the church. And so the book got borne along on good PR caused by having created a scandal. And at the same time, his essays were doing well. But it wasn't really till he wrote The History of England that he became, you know, the nearest thing to a household word. And that was... Um, throughout the later 40s and 50s that was coming out. Uh, I think you could say he made his first big reputation, curiously enough, as a historian rather than as a, a philosopher or even an essayist. What accounts for the rise, then, of his philosophy over and above his history? 
I think its its sheer intellectual power did gradually, slowly get recognized. It was recognized, as I mentioned, by Kant via various kind of people in Germany who introduced Kant to Hume. And I think from then on, it was a, a gradually rising trajectory. It, it got a little bit eclipsed in Victorian times because Hume's irreligion stood in the way of people appreciating him, I think. But then when Darwin revolutionized, you know, the way we think of human beings, the way was clear for people to say, well, you know, Hume had a lot of Darwin's vision before Darwin. He didn't have the, the, the detailed empirical biology, but he did have the same confidence that it was as animals that we had to be understood. And um, since then, in the 20th century, it was a, just a rising graph until, as I say now, he is in almost everybody's pantheon as a philosopher. You yourself are said to hold neo-Humean views, and if that is indeed correct, what separates the Hume or the Humean from the neo-Humean? Uh, um, well, um, the way Hume frames his empiricism is, I think, untenable. I think one has to uh, give a rather different account of experience. Uh, well. Kant put it in a in a nutshell. He was actually talking about John Locke, not Hume. But I think many people would say the same uh, charge applies to Hume. That um, Kant said that Locke sensualized the understanding. Now, by that, Kant meant Locke didn't really make room for conceptual power as well as uh, this the passive data of the senses. He didn't realize the extent to which the mind is already active in interpreting the data of the senses. There's very little of the given. The phrase, the myth of the given, is one of the sort of catchwords of contemporary philosophy. And um, I think Kant was the first to, in effect, say that there is, in consciousness, there's no given. There's only uh, experience which has been marinated and uh, peptonized, to use a phrase of William James's. So I think a more active view of the way the conscious mind processes experience has got to be uh, imported into Hume. I think Hume works with slightly um, uh, antique categories, inevitably. Uh, for example, he, um, uh, his only accounts of motivation are in terms of what he called the passions, and I don't think that's a helpful general term. There's more or nuanced investigations of the sentiments and desires and motivations and emotions are possible. So I think, you know, life has moved on. We've learned things since Hume. There are, you know, adjustments to be made. But, of course, the question of how, uh, of how much of his work that leaves intact uh, is a very difficult one. Uh, in my book, I argue that uh, it leaves a heck of a lot of it intact. And we just... Uh, find ourselves to rediscovered things that he'd uh, put his finger on two and a half centuries ago. But other, other philosophers might take a slightly more pessimistic view of it than that. Or optimistic, if you like, progress. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've used the word adjustments, and it sounds like these are mostly issues of nuance and of degree and of framing. Is there no area where you out and out disagree with David Hume? Other than the general one I've mentioned, which is, is philosophically quite important, because it is basically how we think of the building blocks of our conscious lives, we think of the building blocks of a cognition. That's important. But apart from that, no, I think that, you, you know, you, you, as they say, you've got to get up pretty early to get ahead of Hume. <laughs> and if someone were to have read your book and, say, let's say, several other similar introductory studies of Hume, where, would, where should they start in Hume's actual body of work? What's the way in? Probably the most attractive, charming work. It depends a little bit. If, they, if, if our imagined reader is um, uh, religious, then um, they better not read the dialogues first. If they're not religious, I think the funniest work and one of the most charming uh, are the dialogues concerning natural religion, which he wrote towards the end of his life 
and which were only published after his death. He wouldn't publish them during his life, but he did leave instructions with Adam Smith and the nephew that they were to be published after his death. And they were. And they're hilarious, I think, and very good value. The other place to start, um, and for serious philosophers, I think these are the two books that they, you know, everybody should have on their shelves and have looked at, are the inquiry, which I mentioned, inquiry concerning human understanding, which um, uh, was the, the slightly diluted version of the treatise, which he, he produced 10 years after. Um, and then the um, second inquiry, as it's known, which is the inquiry concerning the principles of morals, which is a utilitarian work on moral philosophy. It sees our uh, capacity for ethics as basically adaptation designed to enable life to go well for ourselves and those around us. Those are, those are two very accessible, easily read books. The Inquiry Concerning the Principles of Morals, Hume said, uh, was of all his rights incomparably the finest. So that was his own judgment. I'm not sure he's right about that. I think the treatise has more intellectual horsepower. But, um, but the inquiry is, 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 the two inquiries are, are quite enchanting, and I would recommend them first. Now, you're known, even outside this particular book on Hume, as a popularizer of philosophy, and I won't claim to know any representative sample of philosophy professors, but the ones that I do know, they don't seem inclined toward popularization of their subject. Why are you? I I enjoy philosophy, and I quite like sharing the enjoyment with people. You know, I feel rather like a musician who's never asked to play at parties. Um, If I enjoy music, I hope other people, people do as well. I think that philosophy and other academic disciplines have been much at fault throughout uh, oh, the last 50 years for allowing themselves to just uh, disappear into the ivory tower. And philosophers, I think, are, are very much at fault in this if we constantly maintain an air of being impenetrable and too difficult for anyone else to touch us. Then we can't be surprised that nobody takes any notice of us. But in fact, I think philosophy has a lot of links these days with cognitive science, with empirical psychology, um, and um, uh, especially with evolutionary psychology, things like game theory and economics, political theory, political science. And we ought to celebrate those links and uh, um, you know, make sure that people know what, uh, what goes on, what's happened. Um, so I, I'm quite unrepentant about that. I don't really like the word popularize because it does have that denigratory kind of um, rather condescending sound. I don't think of myself so much as popularizing philosophy as as of bringing people to philosophy. I, I'm, not, I'm certainly not dumbing down philosophy for people. Um, I think if you dumb it down, then you distort it and it's dishonest. You know, it's not easy to make advances in philosophy and nobody should pretend that it is. But I think it is quite within everybody's grasp to understand what a writer like Hume is about. Um, And just as people can read Darwin without being biologists, so you can read Hume without, you know, having any ambition to go and do graduate work in philosophy as part of the literary heritage of, uh, of the West, and I think ought to be much more widely accessible. What are the greatest challenges for you of bringing people to a philosophy of actually doing the, I don't know if making it more accessible is the challenge. What, what are the hardest parts of getting people to, to come to it? Well, there's prejudice to overcome. The word itself has this kind of weird ring to it. You know, uh, if, you, if I sit next to somebody on an airplane, they say, what do you do? You know, I always take a deep breath before saying I'm a philosopher. <laughs> God knows what they're going to think. So I, I uh, in one of my uh, earlier books, uh, Book, little book called Think, which I wrote as an introductory to, an introduction to philosophy. I said that I wished it to be called itself conceptual engineering, which I thought would have been a much better title. Um, so I could sometimes introduce myself as conceptual engineer. People more or less put up with that. <laughs> but yes, the word is uh, you know it, it, it excites prejudices. I think the hardest part then is just making sure that it is as clear as possible so you can carry people with you. And, you know, there are 
what the French call defamation professionnelle, they're professional defamations, which afflict philosophers. You know, in our talk with each other, we use jargon, we cut corners, we presume that everybody in the conversation knows this, that, or the other, which you can't do if you're writing for to bring people into the subject. So, you know, I have to constantly monitor myself to make sure I'm not presupposing things which I shouldn't and expecting more of readers or or sometimes it's just a question of being blind to traps that you may have unwittingly laid for a reader so they you don't realize that the, you know such and such a phrasing is likely to send them galloping off down the wrong path and um they've constantly got to monitor your own writing and try and keep one's democratic tendencies to the fore you mentioned the scenario where you sit down next to an say, airplane seatmate, and you tell them you're a philosopher, and that opens up a, a can of worms. Now, what I have always imagined is that telling somebody one is a philosopher results in someone who doesn't know the subject assuming, making assumptions about philosophy, that it is essentially, oh, s- saying whatever one wants. Uh, they, c- they confuse philosophy and worldview. Is that actually a... Is that, does, do you encounter that? Yes. Oh, yes, you do. I mean... Um... Uh, as in, oh yes, my philosophy is, you know, always grin and bear it, or <laughs> whatever. Um, yes, you do, and that's one of the, the annoying things about the term. <laughs> um, um, you know, there is there is a, a tendency to think that in terms of, you know, cracker barrel philosophy, or um, just uh, proverbs, ideology, little nuggets of wisdom, which uh, people like to think they've got hold of. And that, of course, has nothing to do with what somebody like uh, Hume or Kant is trying to write about. How do you break that to people, that they have a wrong idea of philosophy? Well, I think these days it's slightly, and it used to be, because one can, um, you can, you know, stand on the coattails of things like cognitive science and say, you know, if you've got somebody of moderate goodwill or education next to you on the airplane, you can say things like, well, what I do really is to look at the way in which... Um, you know, the great minds of the past did cognitive science. They tried to understand the structures of the mind and the way we synthesize views about the world. And that sort of makes sense to people more these days. We are coming up toward the end of the hour, but I do have a large question remaining here. And it is uh, the relevance of Hume right now, today, 2008. What is his, what's the current value of Hume in our world? Well, I think the world would be a better place if more people read him and absorbed what he has to tell us, without doubt. Uh, I've already mentioned the, the cognitive modesty, but Hume also pioneered, and this is something we haven't probably talked enough about, but he, he also pioneered uh, the kind of study that people make of cognitive dysfunctions. In particular, he thought that although our minds are beautifully adapted to steer us around the world as we find it, they go wrong. Uh, I, well, I mentioned the immodesty, you know, reason getting out of control. Um, but he thought that superstition, for example, showed people pretending to things or getting in the grip of ideas which were wrong and which would mislead them and prove to be useless and bad for them. He thought the belief in miracles was of that kind. Um, so all the kind of weird isms that afflict the modern world, things like you know, homeopathy and faith healing and um, various spiritual disciplines, so-called, and heaven knows what, the whole sort of New Age panoply, he would have simply dismissed. And I think rightly. Um, I think he, you know, he's a great enemy of, on the one hand, superstition, which is false or magical thinking, and on the other hand, enthusiasm, which is... uh, the view that you have a hotline to the Holy Spirit and, uh, and, and, and the right, therefore, to tell other people how to behave and how to live their lives and so forth. He saw superstition and enthusiasm as great enemies of human progress. And I think he was right and is still right. Do you think that Hume would, given a glimpse into the world of 2008 during his lifetime, would he be disappointed in what things are like now as far as the superstitions that are prevalent, or would he would he not be as far as the progress humanity has made? He had a very cheerful disposition, in spite of the, the melancholy mood that overcame him when he, when, he, when he thought about the 
uh, the inability of human reason to give us a satisfactory picture of anything. Nevertheless, in his everyday life, he was uh, universally known as the bon David, the the good the good guy. He was convivial. He loved friendship. He conducted correspondence. He joked with people, and so on. So he was the most. He was certainly the the philosopher you want as your dinner companion. On the other hand, I think he saw human nature very squarely. Um, there's a lovely anecdote which I recount in the book, uh, in which. Um, Adam Smith was talking to him short, very shortly before his death. He knew he was dying. And he was quite cheerful about this. And he imagined the excuses he'd give to the ferryman of the dead, Caron, the ferryman who carries bowls across the sticks, for delaying, uh, for delaying his death, in other words. And he'd say, well, you know, I need to make some corrections to the latest editions of my works. And Caron would say, no, 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 this will not be done this many a century. You know, get into the boat this minute. <laughs> and then he would say, ah, but I have been endeavoring to open the eyes of the public, and if I live a little longer and you see the downfall of the prevailing systems of superstition, and Karen would lose all patience and say, this will not happen this many a century. Get into the boat, you lazy, loitering rogue. <laughs> And um, so that shows something both of the temper in which Hume approached his death, but also the uh, fairly realistic view he had about human nature and human progress. The title of the book, once again, is How to Read Hume. Simon Blackburn, a pleasure talking to you. Pleasure talking to you. Thank you for inviting me on. Our music is produced by Ben Althaus. For more information on his work, check out benalthaus.com. And for more information on this show, or about other shows, or for our complete show archive, visit colinmarshallradio.com.